Hello, Daniel. Thanks very much for joining us on the Ideas Lab podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm fascinated by this new book you've got out and by your work. You are a rational emotive behavioral therapist, and we'll ask about that in a moment. And your book I saw uh, placed very prominently recently in WH Smith's. Um, it's called The Four Thoughts That Fuck You Up and How to Fix Them. So there might be a bit of swearing in this. Maybe I should have said that before I said the title of the book, but never mind. And uh, we are joined by you and your therapy dog. Lara. <laughs> What, what's your dog's name? Lara. Lara. Hello, Lara. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, why don't we start? What is rational emotive behavioral therapy, first of all? Um, well, it's actually the first form of CBT. Um, it was developed in the 1950s by a psychotherapist called Albert Ellis. Um, but it doesn't get as much um, prominence or as much of a name check as I think it should. Um, so my MSc was in rational emotive and cognitive behavior therapy, and everyone that graduates from that course and practices REBT has a tendency to just call themselves a CBT therapist. And but as a form of CBT, it's very different from the one that you're used to or have probably had if you've accessed CBT. Um, I always like to make a difference and 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 very clearly delineate that's the form of CBT that you're getting with me. So I was always clear right from the get-go that I am an REBT therapist. REBT is a form of CBT. It's kind of got a lot of philosophy and it has a structure to it. And it's got a very similar approach to CBT, but it looks at things in a, in a completely different way as well. Yeah. And so, I mean, what's it, what's it about? How would you sum it up? I mean, is it is it, you talk about the four thoughts in the book. Is that a good way to start to introduce the concept of REBT? Absolutely. Um, the, 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 the overarching theme of REBT is that it's not the events in life that disturb you. It's what you're telling yourself about those events that disturb you. So if you're stuck, if you're thinking and feeling and acting in ways that you don't like, but don't seem to be able to change, it isn't because of the thing. It's down to what you're telling yourself about the thing. Change what it is that you tell yourself and you get to change how you think, how you feel, how you act. And when it comes to what you're telling yourself, REBT zeroes in on four beliefs, four very specific types of thought that, depending on the context and the situation, will lead to any kind of emotional disturbance and all the other thoughts around it that you can think of. Wow. So we better find out what these four thoughts are then. Do you want to give us a kind of summary? Yeah. So um, th there's a model that we use. It's called the ABCDE model of psychological health. There's an activating event. There's a belief system. There's a consequence. Uh, we dispute. We challenge the beliefs to affect a rational outlook. The four beliefs that sit at B, there are four irrational beliefs, i.e. they disturb you, and then four rational beliefs i.e. they promote psychological well-being. And when it comes to the irrational, first and foremost, we have uh, what we call a dogmatic demand. And a dogmatic demand is just a rigid belief that disturbs you. And it takes the form of words like must and mustn't and should and shouldn't and got to and have to. Um, it's usually also the rigid expression of a desire for something. So it's OK to wish and want and hope for something. The problem is when you tell yourself that it absolutely must be the way that you want it. So we always look for the demand. First of all, behind any problem, there's a demand for something. Now, people who hold demands have a tendency to do a drama. We call it awfulizing. We call it catastrophizing. It's where you make something worse than it actually is. So, for instance, I could have a, a rigid demand about this interview and say, well, it absolutely must go well. It doesn't take into account the fact that I could make mistakes. If I was awfulizing, I would then also tell myself that it would be awful. It would be terrible. It would be a nightmare. It would be the worst thing to happen if it didn't go well. And then people who hold demands have a tendency to exhibit um, what we call the I can't copes or low frustration tolerance. It's where you rate things as unbearable, intolerable, something that you can't hack or deal with. So equally, I could be telling myself, well, that this has to go well. And if it doesn't go well, it will be intolerable to me. 
I think I think I have a bit of that. I mean, it's not not in the dramatic form you describe, but I kind of have a sort of low frustration tolerance sometimes with software, but also um, in the I can very easily feel overwhelmed and go, oh, you know, how on earth? There's a thousand things to do to pull off this project. It's impossible. Is yeah. where my brain immediately goes if I if I'm not careful. Absolutely. I mean, all these terms are part of our everyday terminology. You know, we will talk about the weather and go, oh, God, look at the rain. Isn't it awful? Oh, God, look at the rain. I don't think I can stand much more of it. And we don't mean it. It's just conversational. However, when we attach it to a demand and imply it in certain circumstances, like projects, like software, and you kick off and you feel overwhelmed and you behave dysfunctionally, when you behave in ways that you don't like and don't seem to be able to stop or in ways that don't help you, then it's become meaning laden. It's become a disturbance causing belief rather than a conversational filler. So it sounds this, this, concept of a demand sounds a little bit like a kind of perfectionism thing like somebody must always treat me with respect or the things must always go exactly right otherwise it will be terrible absolutely yeah so there are there are two common ones things must always go right things must be perfect behind any problem so if you kick off whenever you don't feel respected by somebody behind that would be the demand you must respect me um, if you can't travel on the tube train and the thing that you hate the most about the tube trains is getting stuck in a tunnel, your demand would be, I must not get stuck in a tunnel. Mm. Right. The, the fourth unhealthy beliefs, we've got the demand, we've got the awful or the terrible, we've got the I can't stand it. Uh, the final one, I call it a pejorative put down. Um, Albert Ellis called it um, damning. There's self damning. I'm rubbish. I'm a failure. There's other damning. You're rubbish. You're a failure. But we can also put things down in general. So we can say, my job is rubbish. My relationship's completely rubbish. So we rate things globally in the negative. So there's always a demand. And then you might be awfulizing. You might be exhibiting low frustration tolerance. And you might be putting yourself or others or things down. So REBT identifies those four thoughts and helps you shift your mindset to a healthier alternative. So instead of the demand, we have a preference. And the preference is where you state what you would like to happen, but you also accept that it doesn't have to happen. So I prefer it when things go my way, but I also accept that they don't have to go my way. So that's interesting. So let, let's do something topical. People are having a variety of reactions to the coronavirus uh, mm -hmm. fears. And do, do you see that the REBT applies there to people's reactions completely um people are telling themselves they absolutely must not catch it there's a dogmatic demand right there and because they're telling themselves they absolutely must not catch it they're panic buying every single item in in the chemist so there's no toilet rolls on the shelves there's no hand sanitizer on the shelves there are no face masks in the chemist. everything is gone because people are stockpiling because they go oh my god i must not catch it they're isolating themselves. They're not traveling on public transport. Um, they're avoiding anybody that has a bit of a sniffle. Mm. Yeah. But is that, is that, how do we know when our reaction is not rational? Are we, are you, so are you basically saying, you know, uh, this is straight into the irrational? I mean, clearly panic buying toilet tissue is pretty irrational. Yeah, if you're panic buying, that's irrational. If you're terrified about cashing it, that's irrational. If you are washing your hands to the point of soreness every time you touch something, that's irrational. Mm. There is, and um, in REBT, we make a distinction between what we call an unhealthy negative emotion and a healthy negative emotion. With coronavirus, we're talking about anxiety because the theme of anxiety is threat or danger. Now, when you're unhealthily anxious, you overestimate the probability of that threat occurring and you underestimate your ability to deal with it. So you start to think and feel and behave in lots of ways that are actually an overreaction. Right. OK. So how do we know? Like when we we have so many thoughts, I mean, the great challenge I find, which is, of course, why people want to work with, with, with someone like you as a therapist. But the great challenge is. When we have a thought, like I have a lot of self-damning thoughts to say, you know, you screwed that up or, or um, you, you know, you're useless or you're going to end up 
you know, getting some horrible disease or something like that, which is kind of recurring thoughts I have. Um, the, it, it, the problem is it sounds like the truth. It sounds to my brain initially completely realistic, but it makes me feel terrible. So what do I, how do I pick that apart if I was going through the exercises in, in your book or working with you? Uh, well, I, th- th- there are many exercises, but a key one is called disputing. It's the D in that A, B, C, D, E model. Um, and disputing is, is kind of the, the baseline exercise. And it involves challenging your beliefs um, as rationally and as objectively as possible. Because as you said, but we've got thousands and thousands of thoughts banging through our brain every second of the day. Very rarely, if ever, do we take a step back and question the validity of that thought. We just run with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are three key disputing questions. And those questions are, well, is this belief true? Does this belief make sense? And does this belief actually help me? Mm. So let's take a self-damning statement. Um, Let's say that you've, um, you've, you've done something wrong and you're telling yourself that you are useless, that you are a failure. Yeah. Well, first of all, the healthy version of that would be I'm not useless and I'm not a failure. Even if I stuff something up, I'm a worthwhile, fallible human being. So we would challenge both the unhealthy and the healthy belief with those three questions. Is it true is a science question. It wants proof. So if you say yes, it's true or no, it's false. Either way, you need to back your answer up with a little bit of evidence. Um, does it make sense is a kind of common sense approach. Just because I think this, is it logically uh, logical to assume that? Does it help me is obviously, I hope, the most obvious answer. I want to get myself under control. Does that statement help me to do that, yes or no? So I am useless. I am a failure if I get something wrong. Well, that's a kind of global definition of yourself. It's a blanket term. For you to be a failure, it would mean that you have only ever failed, that you only will fail, that your life is nothing littered with nothing but negatives, that you've achieved nothing, that you've got no skills, you've got no qualifications, you've got no abilities. It's all crosses in a picture of you. Well, that's nobody. We've all achieved things. We've all succeeded in things. It doesn't matter whether they're large or small. If you can point to one success, that's all you, the evidence you need to negate the statement, I'm a failure. Right, yeah. Yeah. Now, if I said to you, I have failed my driving test, therefore I am a failure, would you tell me I was making sense? No, I would say not. Okay, good. What if I said, well, that was a big fib. I've actually found it a hundred times now, so that must mean I'm a failure. Would you tell me I was making sense? No, I'd say you just got a problem taking, passing the test. Possibly. Now you're thinking sensibly. Maybe I've got a problem with taking tests. Maybe I've got an anxiety. If I get the anxiety under control, well, I'll pass the test. Maybe I've got a, a problem with my instructor. And I don't gel, change the instructor, change the outcome, pass the test. Or maybe I just need to accept that I'm no good at driving. Mm. But no good at driving isn't the same as being no good at everything or no good as a person. So when you make a mistake, if you write yourself off, that's the same error. You go, okay, well, I got that wrong. I failed at that. Therefore, I must be a failure. It's an illogical leap from one to the other. Yeah. Now, when you call yourself useless, when you call yourself a failure, how do you feel? Bad. Really bad, yeah. Unconfident, miserable. You feel useless. How long does that feeling stay with you? Sometimes for hours. Yeah, for hours. Um, In worst case scenarios, you start to cloud your judgment and you only focus on your failures and you start to build this false narrative where you get everything wrong. Now, on the other side, on the healthy side, I am not a failure. I'm not useless. Even if I get something wrong, I'm a worthwhile, fallible human being. REBT says that all human beings are worthwhile and fallible. Worth is innate. We don't have to prove it. We're worthwhile. We're all human beings. We all live. We all die. Um, None of us know really why we're here, and we're all making the best of it. And as we go through the living bit, we get it right, we get it wrong, we succeed, we fail, we have good days, we have bad days. We're all the same. We're all worthy. 
And we're all fallible because we all make mistakes and we've all got character flaws, physical flaws, psychological flaws. Fallible is, again, another level up. Now, if you make a mistake, that doesn't mean you're a failure because it doesn't take into account of all the successes. Just remember, one success proves you're not a failure. So you're not a failure, even if you make a mistake, but you are a worthwhile, fallible human being. Now, the mistake proves the fallibility, but your innate humanness proves your worth. So it's a much more accurate picture. Yeah, I like that. And I wonder, I suppose it kind of, the, the danger is if you, if you do this with other people without your level of skill, it becomes yeah. a bit like, you know, when you've got the person in the office who's always catastrophizing about everything and you yeah. feel like, you know, well, get a grip, that's not going to happen. So how do we make sure? Well, yeah, I mean, get a grip, that's not going to happen, can work on some people. Um, I have um, a, a story of one of my mum's friends where it, it, it did. Um, she was a catastrophizer. And uh, her friends were kind of finding her difficult to manage. And she was having a project done on her house. And she was having one long moany rant. And, and the head builder turned around and just went, oh, Jesus Christ, love, will you just shut up? It's never going to happen. And she went, well, you can't talk to me like that. And he went, I can. I'm your builder. I'm not your therapist. Shut it. And, and it worked for a good long while. It, it snapped her out of her catastrophizing mindset. So you can say, well, look, that's not going to happen. But also, if you know any of these kind of disputing skills, you can just tease it out of people and go, well, OK, you've just said that that's awful. That's the worst thing. Is it the worst thing? Can you not think of anything worse? Because you can. OK, a project just went wrong and you're going, oh, my God, calamity, awful, terrible. Well, no, it isn't. Think of all the other projects that you said awful and calamity and terrible about for a wobbler and then fixed when you calm down. Think of all the other things in life that could be worse than the project going a bit wrong, like you, you getting a health complication or losing a loved one or dying. In the scheme of things, where would this bad thing sit on your scale of badness? Because things are bad. But just because something is bad, it doesn't make any sense to say that it's awful. So you can just say to people, is this really the worst thing that you can think of happening? Have you had other projects go wrong before? How bad was it? What happened? How do you feel when you tell yourself it's the worst thing? It's a nightmare. Because what you will be behaving like is, a, a, you know, but you're throwing a tantrum. You're behaving like a drama queen. And it, it sounds very simple, isn't it? But when I've experimented with these things, uh, with, with similar things, um, I've been surprised how effective it is. And one of the ideas of rational emotive uh, behavioural therapy, isn't it that basically your thinking determines how you feel? Absolutely. Because um, not all therapists believe that. You know, there was, you yeah. know, it certainly seems to be one good branch of therapy that believes that feelings are some mysterious thing that, you can never understand and yeah. um, and they just blow this way and that like, uh, like the wind. But in actual fact, that's not the opinion of REBT, is it? No. Um, it, that's based on um, the teachings of the Stoics, more importantly, Epictetus and, and Marcus Aurelius and things like that, because that opinion goes right through to history, um, prehistory rather. Epictetus said that it's not the events in life that disturb you, it's what you tell yourself about those events that disturbs you. Marcus Aurelius said that um, the happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. Shakespeare said there is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Uh, but one of my favourite quotes comes from Pirates of, the Captain, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean when Captain Jack Sparrow said, the problem is not the problem, the problem is your attitude about the problem. Yeah. That's it on the front cover of your book, isn't it? Uh, well, it paraphrased heavily because we don't want to get stuck by Disney. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, so it's it's what we make of of um, of what happens to us, not just what happens to us. And d does this work for depression even? Because you know, people will tell you depression is a sort of biochemical thing that happens. Uh, well, yes and no. Um, most depressions are reactive. They are reactions to events. 
talking about um, the coronavirus, the theme of anxiety is threat or danger. The theme of depression is loss and failure because life contains losses and failures. And often a depression is a, an emotional problem. It's a reaction to a loss or a failure. Change the beliefs behind the depression and you can change depression to sadness because it's okay to be sad about the same losses or failures. The kind of depression you're talking about, when it's biochemical, um, that's a clinical condition. Um, that's when the ethos of it's not the events in life that disturb you, it's what you tell yourself falls down, because there's a little caveat. By and large, all human beings disturb themselves by their beliefs, except people with clinical conditions, because it is biochemical, it's brain chemistry. However, the depression, the clinical condition, becomes an activating event at A. It's a thing. Well, you can choose to disturb yourself even further about that thing or not. And people often do. So they'll tell themselves that they shouldn't have it or they should be able to deal with it better than they do. Or it is awful or it has ruined their life or it's all their fault and they're useless failures that just deserve the condition. Another a friend of mine tells himself he's being childish when he gets depressed. Exactly. I think one of the things that, that if I get depressed, I probably tell myself that it will be like this forever. Yeah. And, and you know, so, so then you're taking, uh, you know, even if there was a biological cause for the depression, you're taking it and you're sort of embedding it and so there are it sounds like there are things you could do which would make some difference at least absolutely when you change the beliefs about the condition you're left with whatever it is that condition does um, because the clinical condition comes and goes at whim you can have good days you can have days where it's just a, a mild effect there are days when it has a massive effect but just think take your friend take what effect does it have on his psychological well-being when he tells himself that he's being childish because of this condition yeah well it makes him worse absolutely nobody says you're being childish when you won't walk on your broken leg yes yeah, yeah. That says you're being childish when you say, I'm staying at home, I've got the flu. Mm. You're not being childish when you're dealing with depression. You're a worthwhile, fallible human being who is dealing with depression. Yeah. So you can deal with the condition and you can make it worse or not. Right. No, that's fascinating stuff. How did you get into REBT originally? What drew you to it? I, actually, it started off as uh, I was drawn to hypnotherapy. I um, I was a journalist at the time. One of the magazines that I was working on was a health title. And we did this big thing on stopping smoking. And it was supposed to be a year-long feature with three-month follow-ups. And we had people stopping with patches, gums, the Alan Carr book, acupuncture, hypnotherapy. The hypnotherapy interested me. So I had stopping smoking for hypnotherapy and become part of the feature. Love the hypnotherapy. Oddly, at the same time, I got a new gym buddy who turned out to be um, a director at a hypnotherapy college. He noted my interest, got me on an introductory course. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I studied the the, uh, the subject um, and started practicing as a hypnotherapist. And not long after I graduated from that, the, the, the guy that got me interested in it he was a, a rational emotive behavior therapist as well as a hypnotherapist. And he had just finished writing this course that he was going to teach. And when he started telling me about REBT, I just loved it because I kind of naturally think in that way anyway. Because um, at the time I was working in customer publishing and that was a very dramatic environment. And it was full of people who did awful lies, who did kick off and say that things were intolerable when they did go wrong or did beat themselves or other people up. And there was a little hardcore group of us that were just naturally more rational. So when I he first started talking about the REBT, I went, well, I really like that. That, that That's that's how I think. That's how all people should think. It'd be much nicer if we did. I started studying it, had an affinity for the subject. Um, after that, I did a, an MSc in the subject. And there I am, umpteen years down the line, still practicing and uh, written a book on the subject. Yeah, that's fantastic. And so um, uh, is there anything else we should we can use from REBT that's a nice, simple thing that will... But, uh, uh, but can make a big difference? 
Um, disputing is the key thing. Um, there are many other exercises on top of that that, that they, they would take a while to explain. Um, but you can. there's one simple thing you can add to disputing, and it's just to embellish the, does this help me? Because if it doesn't help you, you can ask yourself, well, what is it doing then? Mm. It's called a persuasive argument. So you can go, okay, if I call myself useless, if I can prove that that isn't true, if I can prove that it doesn't make sense, and if I can demonstrate that it doesn't help me, then I need to talk about what it's actually doing. Because what it's actually doing is um, sucking away your confidence. You can give examples of things you might not put yourself forward for because you believe yourself to be useless. Um, job interviews, social occasions, you name it, you can sketch these things out. And then on the other side, on the healthy side, you go, okay, well, if, if this belief is true and it does make sense and it does help me, what will it do? Well, if I held it, then I would be more confident. I would believe in myself more. I'd put myself forward for those things that I don't put myself forward for. I would accept myself when I make mistakes. And instead of beating myself up, I would learn from the experience. And when you ask the, well, what do I get question, you're painting two pictures, one of a life currently lived according to your unhealthy beliefs, which is going to look a bit bleak and miserable when you actually write it down in black and white. And then one of a life that could be lived according to that healthy belief, which is clearly going to look happier, healthier and a, a much more attractive proposition. Yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, even if you stand, you know, a genuine chance of, you know, for instance, getting ill or, I mean, we all stand a, some chance of getting the coronavirus, um, you know, does the thought that it's going to kill me help you? Well, <laughs> not really. <laughs> if, if the thought is let's be careful, then yes, that's a helpful thought. But yeah, I mean, when you look at the media, it's inescapable and it's huge and, and they're making it scary. But the, the statistics, look, first of all, look at the advice, the government advice, the World Health Organization advice, the medical advice is wash your hands regularly. That's it. Well, that's the advice. The advice is quite low key and that's enough. So what should you focus on? The big scary media or the wash your hands a bit more regularly than you do? Because of, um, I mean, yes, it's communicable, but 84% of the cases are mild end of the spectrum. So, yeah. so only 16% are going to be severe. And then it's all depending on your age and whether you've got other underlying health complications. Now, if you are elderly or, and you do have underlying health complications, then yes, your precautions need to be higher than somebody else. But if you f don't fit those two things, then you can really bring your threat level down. Washing your hands is enough. If you do catch it, the symptoms are probably gonna be mild. And I think also it helps me because I do have that catastrophic thinking yeah. um, uh, about, uh, about health and about other things that threaten my safety. Yeah. And it, I think the, you know, the rational stuff helps. Like if you, worst case scenario of 15 or 20% get hospitalized um yeah. that means you've got an 80 percent chance of not not needing any medical treatment whatsoever and i suspect although i'm not a virologist and i haven't studied that well but those numbers will improve because what we're seeing in places where um the where they're doing the most testing the actual fatality rates and severe illness rates are coming down because they're discovering all these people who have the disease at a much more mild level. Now, I still think we should take it really seriously. Uh, I'm not one of those people who says, oh, it's all nonsense. Um, yeah. So we should be yeah. careful because even at the spectrum. you know, 1% fatality rate, it means an awful lot of uh, elderly people and people with uh, medical conditions are, are going to die if it, if it affects a lot of people. So we shouldn't yeah. take it, we shouldn't, you know, pretend it's nothing. It's suddenly more serious from a normal flu. But I agree that the... The media does what it normally does, particularly the papers yeah. in the UK, and they're taking uh, the plans of, uh, you know, when the government released its plans for what would happen in the worst case scenario, they took those and put them on the front page and said, you know, government plans to not even investigate murder and shut yeah. all schools. Yes, if things go to the worst stage possible. Absolutely. 
the, the Metro, um, the government released um, their worst case scenario was 80% of the population could be infected. That was their worst case scenario. And the government, their worst case scenario was that 80% of the population could be infected. But that was the worst case scenario possible. And uh, at least three newspapers that day turned that into their front page headline. Coronavirus will affect 80%. And you're like, are you kidding me? Well, it works, I've unfortunately, got- because our brains have these cognitive biases yeah. that if you say something scary, we want to check out what the scary thing. Absolutely. Well, I mean, catastrophization is one of those cognitive biases, the tendency to make things worse than they actually are. When you do that, when you have that bias, you ignore the favorable and focus purely on the unfavorable. You have blinkers on um, and all you're inviting is more misery because you'll ignore the, 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 the silver lining and go straight for the, the, you know, the darkness and the cloud. But also the papers and, and, and the media have to make things negative because negative sells. Yeah. So they want to make as much money and get as many uh, viewing figures as possible. And they do that by ramping up the negativity and the, and the, the salaciousness of everything. Um, yeah. And then um, people who catastrophize. I mean, there are, as you said, people are going, oh, shut up. They're taking blase too far. We need caution, definitely but we don't need panic. When you catastrophize, you're heading towards panic. Yeah. No, I like it. So I, I'm um, a big fan of this stuff. Like I say, when I I used to be one of those people who believe it, that, that you couldn't alter your feelings so easily. And and it was an early book, which I think was an REBT book called Feeling Good, which is it's decades old now. Um, and it has these really simple exercises. And I realized... Cool what uh what an effect it has i thought this won't work and did the a few just a few of the exercises and went oh i feel like significantly better about everything yes. and so i'm a big believer in this stuff and in your book you take people through the exercises uh don't you to yeah there's um rebt is considered to be both a system of psychotherapy but also a school of thought so REBT to invites you to work on specific problems, but to also look at life in a whole new way. And so the, the first two parts of the book just focus on those four unhealthy beliefs and the four healthy equivalents. And then part three is just like a, a step-by-step, six-week process to help you pick a particular problem, whether it's an anxiety issue or an anger management problem or a, a reactive depression issue, and then just work through it systematically until you gain control and start living life according to those healthy beliefs so that the unhealthy negative emotion becomes a healthy negative one. Mm, I like the sound of that. That sounds great. I make a very good online course, by the way, Daniel, if you ever thought of doing that. Uh, I have, <laughs> funnily enough. Step by step, plan by plan. Okay, well, thanks very much. And if people want to find the book, it's on Amazon and it's in um, all good bookshops. As I say, I saw it in, on prominent display in, in WH Smith, the four thoughts that have rocked you up. And, um, and and if you want to find out about you and the therapy that you do, your website is, remind me. Uh, it's just my name, danielfryer.com, and Fryer is F-R-Y-E-R. Great. You'll find out a bit more about the dog on there as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the dog stars the sheep. Brilliant. She does. She's, a, she's a tool and a lure. <laughs> I like it. Okay, well, thanks very much, Daniel. I appreciate that. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me.